Reeling from the unprecedented devastation of a global pandemic, nurturing wounds from a brutal military victory abroad, struggling to accommodate demobilized soldiers into a slumping economy fraught with heated competition for jobs, Jim Crow's separate but equal policies endorsed by the President of the United States himself, now firmly in place as the law of the land, white supremacists targeted terrorist attacks on an all too familiar scapegoat. In another epidemic, black citizens found themselves on the lethal end of an outbreak of racial violence in 1919, so horrific that the civil rights leader James Weldon Johnson called it the Red Summer. The events unfolding across the United States today in the wake of the brutal murder of George Floyd are an eerie repetition of events that marred the history of race relations in this country almost exactly a century ago. African-American soldiers returned from noble service in Europe during World War I, fully expecting that their sacrifices to their country would at long last entitle them to their full rights as equal citizens. Instead, the uniforms they wore literally became targets on their backs. W.E.B. Du Bois famously said that we returned from fighting, um, we returned fighting. We've saved democracy overseas and we're gonna save it in the United States. That didn't happen. Between April and November of 1919, with the country devastated by an influenza pandemic known as the Spanish flu, racial unrest rolled through the South, the North and the Midwest, where the Great Migration was just unfolding in its earliest years. The migration, of course, had transformed large parts of the North and the West. In 1915, there were hardly a few black people in Chicago. By 1919, 1.2 million people have spread themselves across the map. This demographic transformation of the color of the urban North, coupled with the stresses of a post-war economic downturn, combined to create the volatile conditions under which African-American workers conveniently became magnets for white resentment and fear. The pushback was fierce. Chicago was wracked by fights along a dividing artery between one population and the other. Hundreds of people are dead. Cities are smoldering. It was one of the most vicious, virulent, and violent race riots in our nation's history. Small towns were also shaken by race-fueled violence. In Elaine, Arkansas, for example, white vigilantes joined plantation owners, sheriffs, deputies, and even state officials to battle what they called an uprising. Hundreds of black sharecroppers were murdered merely for trying to form a union. Yet in the aftermath, a grand jury callously indicted more than 100 black women and men for their so-called crimes. Of course, racial violence was anything but new in the America of that time. Still, amid the fallout from the Great War, the rising generation calling themselves new Negroes was not about to fold their tents. Instead, Red Summer saw black Americans not only picking up arms to defend themselves, but also utilizing political organizations like the NAACP to challenge the violence in Congress, in the courts, in the media, and on the streets. In If We Must Die, the poet Claude McKay captured the tenor of the times in his immortal call for defiance in the face of tyranny and terror. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back.